you are about to witness the death of a leviathan. This century, two million whales have been killed by man for his own commercial gain. This is the story of the greatest creatures the world has ever known, and the story of one man's fight to learn their secrets. The man, Dr. Roger Payne. His passion and his life work, the whale. If you're a small animal, you lead a frantic, frightened life. To a mosquito, a raindrop must seem like a tidal wave. But if you're a whale, all but the grandest things must pass beneath your notice. As the largest animal, including the dinosaurs, that has ever lived on Earth, you can afford to be gentle and to view life without fear. It is this sense of tranquility, life without urgency, power without aggression, that has completely won my heart to whales. Psalms describe the whale as that leviathan whom God has made to take his pastime in the oceans. Today, mankind is putting an end not only to the pastimes, but to the very presence in our oceans of the great leviathan himself. On a lonely beach in the Argentine, surrounded by elephant seals, Roger Payne pursues a study that has made him one of the world's leading scientific experts on whales. A passionate defender of these rare giants, he helped persuade the US government to put a total ban on the import of whale products. How does a man set about studying a subject as remote and immense as a 60-foot whale? A creature which, like an iceberg, is mainly underwater. The link in Payne's case was acoustics, including the strange noises, often inaudible to human ears, by which many creatures communicate or hunt. For his work on how owls find their prey in total darkness, Roger Payne received a doctorate at Cornell University. One night, he was working in his laboratory at Tufts University on how moths detect the sonic pings of hunting bats and avoid capture, when the local radio announced that the body of a small whale, it turned out to be a dolphin, had been washed ashore nearby. For some reason he still can't explain, he set out into the wet night for the seashore. All the way along the beach, I just couldn't wait to get a look at that whale. I'd never seen one up close, and I felt irresistibly drawn to it. When I finally reached it, I was to see that what had happened was pretty typical of what happens to any whale when it encounters man. Two people had carved their initials in the body, and someone else had rammed a cigar butt in the blowhole. Standing there, looking at its lovely, subtle curves, glistening in the cold rain, I decided to try to learn enough about whales to have some influence on their fate. Roger Payne began his whale study in Bermuda with research on whale sounds. 
small sailing boats became his seagoing recording studios. He chose Bermuda because a small band of humpback whales gathers offshore there every April. Payne had heard some recordings of humpback sounds made by an old friend, Frank Watlington. Now he meant to learn the nature and meaning of those sounds. Perhaps the main force that drove him was the thought of that mutilated carcass on the beach. Never far from his mind was the history of persecution the whale has suffered at the hands of man. People think of the height of the whale slaughter as being at the end of the last century, when the New England whalers pursued the sperm whale in sailboats, not much bigger and certainly not as fast as this sloop. The greatest 10-year kill that has ever been made was between 1960 and 1970. At least in the old days, whales had some chance of getting back at their tormentors. Off Bermuda, Rogers sought out his whales in much the same fashion as the old-time Nantucket and New Bedford whalers, searching from a masthead while under full sail. As the New England whalers killed off the right and sperm whales in the North Atlantic, bigger ships were needed to make longer voyages. Even so, a three-year voyage in the 1890s only killed about 37 whales, one whale a month. In the 1960s, catches averaged 30 times as much, between one and two whales a day. Even in the early 1900s, as this rare early whaling film and Hollywood reconstruction show, methods were still extremely crude. Modern whalers had to be faster and bigger, simply because whales became harder and harder to find. The harpoon had a charge that went off like a bomb inside the whale. As a result of public outrage and the Save the Whale campaign started in the 1970s, whaling is now 1% of what it was then when these pictures were taken. But there are new dangers today. Drift netting may be killing more whales and porpoises than whaling ever did. However, the major threat now is probably from the toxic substances that man dumps into the sea, which may represent the total undoing, not just of the whales, but all marine mammals. But let's return to Roger Payne's research work. His Bermuda whale hunts ended in a quite different and peaceful way. He was able to sail right among the humpbacks and record their sounds with an underwater microphone. For hours at a time, my wife Katie and I sailed in the company of whales or their songs. I think there is nothing that has happened to me that can compare with those days. Rocking gently in a boat with those sounds flooding up out of the sea is like no other experience. In 1970, those songs reached a wider public on a best-selling record that became a cult, especially with young people. It had a strange effect, deeply touching the emotions, as if it spoke of life's sea origins long forgotten. The Paines analyzed the sounds by means of a machine called a spectrograph. It was Katie who, after several seasons' research, discovered that the songs were different each year. The whales were adding or changing phrases each season, as if to say, this is our song for this year. Before the noise of ships' propellers interfered with certain wavelengths, some whales, at least, might have heard their own kind calling over a distance of several thousand miles. Today's range is limited to about 500 miles. Most of the ocean, especially the once whale-populated Antarctic Ocean, is silent because these lonely wastes are practically empty of whales.
there are so few whales left in the world. Where could Roger Payne find a place where he could study numbers of whales close to shore? The answer was here, Peninsula Valdis in Patagonia. The dark patches in this space photograph show the two bays that attract the whales to Peninsula Valdis, large, safe and virtually landlocked. A sea paradise where life happens with serenity and elemental power. Whales which arrive off Valdis each May and stay until December are different from those whose songs Roger Payne studied off Bermuda. They're southern right whales. The old whalers gave them that name because they were the right whales to hunt. At this time of year their natural home is the surf and the females come close into the shore. Today right whales are finally protected as a result of the pressure of public opinion and the ruling of the International Whaling Commission. It was in 1970 that Roger Payne, then working for the New York Zoological Society, made his first exploratory trip to Valdis. That first afternoon, strolling along the beach among the elephant seals, with the whales 30 yards out, I could hardly believe I was alive. For a moment there, I honestly thought I'd died and gone to heaven. It was perhaps the nicest afternoon I'll ever spend. That first trip, Katie and I spent only a month at Valdez. It was enough to tell me that here was the place to get to know and understand something of the mysterious ways of the right whale. It was cold and windy, and we lived in a small tent with elephant seals for company. They make good company. The whales were so close that I often felt I could touch them. At the end of the month, I came away with a distinct feeling that I'd been living in paradise. The following August, Roger returned to Valdis to start his study in earnest, this time with additional help from the National Geographic Society. Katie Payne readily agreed to taking the four children out of school for three months. They could always catch up on lessons later. The Paynes decided that the adventurous life they were about to share would be a greater educational experience. Sam is the youngest. He was then seven. Then there was Holly, nine. Laura, eight, and John, 11. And somehow, fairly chaotically, that first camp on the bleak and windy foreshore of Valdis got set up. All our other experiences indicated that there's little likelihood of being harmed by whales. They're like cows, really, and seem to me the most beguiling and gentle creatures on Earth. I'm sure they're far too alert to overlook a boat in their vicinity. So I felt little concern that a whale might crush a boat when it's breaching. That's leaping from the water. With the children aboard, I tried to stay wide of whales that were playing boisterously. And believe me, whales can play boisterously, especially large calves who are clumsy and fearless oafs, something that wouldn't worry me if they weren't bigger than elephants. Gradually, on these early boat trips, Roger began to piece together a picture of the creature he was studying, the southern right whale. The southern right whale is, to put it mildly, a very peculiar looking animal. It's staggering size for one thing. The right whale is one of the largest of the 10 species of great whales and a big one can reach 60 feet in length. 
That's the mouth, the line of the jaws curved like a flamingo's beak. The white patches are called callosities. Coarse hairs grow among them. The callosities are often mistaken for barnacles. When you see a whale really close, and you wouldn't want to get much closer than this, it's the breadth of the back that's impressive. An adult right whale's back can be 15 feet across. It looks like a submerged reef or the bottom of a capsized steamer. On a big whale, the tail flukes are well over 20 feet across. And a single pectoral fin stands nine feet out of the water. People sometimes forget that whales are air-breathing mammals. Well, here are the gigantic nostrils the blowholes to prove it. The weight of an adult is often around 65 tons, and 65 tons, suddenly dumped in the ocean, makes quite a splash. Head on, the animal looks a bit like a nuclear submarine, minus its conning tower. Color varies quite a bit. Remember Moby Dick and Captain Ahab's search for the white whale? Well, here's a whale we've known for four years, a right whale that is nearly a white whale. He was snow white at birth. The trouble is, no matter how much you watch whales from the surface, you seldom get a sense of what the whole animal looks like, except when breaching, almost nothing shows. Part of Katie Payne's work at Valdis was building up an identification system for all the whales that called in at the bay each year. She did this mostly with photographs, but she also painted some of the whales. Katie's artwork gives an excellent idea of what a southern right whale looks like when all the component parts, only glimpsed from the surface, are put together. This is a whale looking straight ahead. To do this, he must raise his head because the eyes are sighted low down under that bulge. This sketch shows just how much whale remains hidden when the animal is lying near the surface. There's that downward looking eye again, with the curve of the lower jaw shown clearly by its grey colouring. And from a gull's eye view, callosities, jaws and blowhole with bubbles streaking back as a calf turns to keep station with its mother. In their second season at Valdis, the Paines were ready for more detailed study. They built a cliff-top hut because tents had proved useless for working in the howling Patagonian wind. And the Paines were beginning to get worried about disturbance to the whales caused by continuous use of the boat. From their windproof hut, they could observe, record and photograph. As they worked, the underwater microphones, or hydrophones, anchored in the bay constantly filled the hut with whale sounds. But the great thing about the clifftop hut was that the whales came so close in shore. Using telephoto lenses, identification dossiers were built up on over a thousand individuals. The white markings on head and jaws are different in every single whale, as distinctive as a man's fingerprints. They change slightly as the whale grows older, but retain the same basic, highly individual patterns. By checking the face patterns of whales as they arrive in the bay against the photographs, the pain soon established that many of the same whales return to Valdis year after year, mothers often bringing very young calves with them and sometimes giving birth in the shallow waters of the bay. From the high incidence of calves, Roger Payne began to think that the main attraction of the Valdis Peninsula was the shelter it gave to the youngsters. Some research couldn't be done from the hut. For instance, measuring whales that didn't come close to the cliffs. 
This had to be tackled from the air, though not from the air alone. Roger invented his own special technique. If he could take an aerial photograph of a whale alongside an object of known size, then by comparing the two, he could calculate the whale's size. The object was a circular white disc, one meter in diameter, mounted on the bow of a rubber boat. All the boat had to do, directed by radio from the plane, was to get in the picture with the selected whale. Often these smaller members of the whale family, called Fitzroy's dolphins, accompanied the boat apparently just for the fun of it. This time, it's the white whale who unsuspectingly is posing for his aerial portrait. When the pictures are developed, it's a simple matter to measure how many times the one meter disc goes into the whale's length. That makes the white whale over 20 feet long, not yet half grown. Besides taking aerial photographs, Roger was sometimes able to enjoy the sheer beauty of whales in a playful mood. But as Roger was to discover, whales don't leap like this just for joy. There's a purpose behind these great plumes of spray. The children had much of their parents' patience when it came to studying and observing animals. This shy little creature is a quis, a relative of the guinea pig that lived around the Payne's camp. They're not easily tamed, but Laura and Sam willingly put in hours getting the quis used to human presence. This rapport with wild animals, large and small, is one of the things that Roger and Katie Payne believe will have compensated their children for the isolation of Valdis. Possibly the best thing the parents and children got from the whale study was a tremendous sense of family unity. Unity not only within the group, but with their environment as a whole. It was hard not to feel this harmony with whales continually blowing and calling in the background, even during breakfast. Roger and Katie felt that their children would catch up on any formal learning they'd missed once the Valdez study had ended. And later, all of them completed university degrees. What Valdez gave them 
was something taught in no school or university on earth. Monsters are part of Halloween celebrations. So what other monster could the Payne family have possibly chosen? In case you don't recognize it, it is a Basilosaurus, an extinct ancestor of the right whale, complete with blowhole and tail flukes. So the strangest whale ever seen on the coast of Patagonia approached the Payne's camp and collapsed on the sand. One day, a strange new apparition appeared on the beach at Valdis. A truck bumped down the rutted track between the dunes at the end of a rough 600-mile ride from Buenos Aires. The load it carried had been christened the Monster by cameraman Des Bartlett, who helped design it. The Monster was the joint brainchild of Roger Payne and Des Bartlett. If it looks like the conning tower of a submarine, that's because this is more or less what it is. In fact, it's a large tank equipped with a hatch and watertight windows designed for underwater whale observation. From the very moment of its arrival, the whales turned up to observe it. A pair swam close inshore as the three-ton monster was painstakingly unloaded. Launching a submarine is easy compared with launching a submersible, or anyway, this submersible. As captain of this strange craft, Roger made a careful inspection of his floating, or possibly sinking, command. The expressions on the faces of his launching crew, including the truck driver and Katie, unmistakably say, God bless all who sail in her, and thank God it won't be me. Getting the three-ton monster off the truck and down the beach took the best part of five days. Then all they had to do was to wait for the tide to come in. But first for the final fitting out. They hoped that the whales would grow used to the monster so that they could observe them behaving naturally through special watertight windows. The windows were made of curved plastic to avoid distortion. Now Roger had to wait, like King Canute, for the tide to come in. In an hour or two, he'd know whether the calculations were correct and whether the two tons of lead ballast loaded aboard were sufficient to keep the monster on an even keel. At last, tidal liftoff was achieved. Katie and graduate student Bernd Versig towed the weird-looking craft out into the bay. Throughout this phase, the whales kept a close watch on the proceedings. Roger descended for his first waterline view of one monster from another. From the half-submerged window, only the rubber boat showed up. But the top window gave him a magnificent view of a curious whale. I wasn't surprised that the whales showed such interest in the monster. They had systematically destroyed or set adrift everything we ever moored in the bay. Hydrophones, boats, boys, tide gauges, the lot. 
Now, from the lower window, I could see this one was really interested in his new toy. First, he moved in close and sat quietly for a long while, thinking it over, I suppose. The rubber boat was still standing by. He then began making slow passes, getting braver and bolder and closer and more excited with every pass. I called Katie on the walkie-talkie to tell her to launch a rescue party for the monster and that I was about to bail out. I was confident this whale didn't mean to be aggressive, but the hatch, which was still open, took ten minutes to close and it hadn't been tested and found watertight. I untied the rubber boat and shoved off, only just in time as it happened. One whale caught its fin around the anchor rope and took the three-ton monster, plus its anchor, a 55-gallon drum filled with concrete for a ride. Amazingly, the monster stayed afloat. But it's just as well Roger abandoned ship. If it had filled, it would have sunk like a stone, taking its captain with it. Whales may be gentle, but they're awfully big. And as Roger's studies were beginning to confirm, they can be careless and play a little rough. For four long years, the pains followed the day-to-day -day life of the Valdis whales. Gradually, an intimate portrait of their behavior has emerged. How whales relate to one another, how they communicate, their forms of play and their forms of competition, the things that interest them and the things that don't. The studies have opened up an entirely new world of knowledge about these gentle giants. For example, an observation about one of the whale's most familiar aspects, its spout. When a whale blows, the vapor cloud isn't just condensed moisture from the air in its lungs, but surface water trapped in the trough round its blowholes. This is suddenly atomized by the whale violently breathing out. Another thing Roger learnt was that whales have a highly developed sense of play which takes many forms. Breaching, that is arching out of the water and crashing back, is one of their most frequent activities. It's also a means of communication, especially in rough weather when breaching is a noisy activity. So when the wind comes up and the roar of waves drowns out their calls, they resort to breaching, apparently, to maintain contact with each other. Seen from the air, an adult whale breaching produces about the same disturbance as a pattern of depth charges. Another form of communication, lobtailing, slamming the tail down on the water. The whales use this to tell each other where they are. Often a whale will crack its tail down 30 or more times. Some of these blows produce a deafening crash that can be heard five miles away. One of the discoveries that most delighted Roger was that whales can sail. In a light wind, they stand on their heads, holding their tail flukes at right angles to the wind and are driven ponderously along. As far as anyone knows, 
They're the only mammals, except man, that consciously use the wind to travel without effort. This whale isn't sailing. It's a female successfully avoiding an ardent male who's swimming around frustrated beneath her. As long as she keeps this attitude, he can't do anything about it. The strategy only fails when her tail sinks beneath the surface. So she quickly recovers her position using flippers to hoist her tail into the air again. She's lifting at least 15 tons. Females often keep this up for hours at a time. Roger has found that whales are completely tolerant of other marine creatures, including sea lions, which often play around them. Probably this is because they have no one to fear, except the carnivorous killer whales, which he believes may occasionally prey on small whale calves. He finds young sea lions are incapable of passing a mother whale with calf without turning back to play in the wash from its tail, and dolphins ride on the whale's bow wave. The whales often lie with their backs out of water so long that their skin burns in the sun. The gulls not only walk around on them, but feed on the peeling skin. They have now learned to remove chunks of live flesh as well, which irritates the whales so much that it sometimes drives them away. Whales are one of the comparatively few species, like man, that mate all the year round. At Valdis, the principal social activity is courtship and mating. Up to seven males compete for the same female, but they may cooperate, helping each other by pushing the female underwater so that one of them may mate with her. But they also fight, rubbing their hard, rough callosities on their opponent's backs. The callosities act rather like the antlers of a stag. A whale's skin is extremely thin, so that even a light rub may in fact cause enough pain to dissuade rivals. There's gentleness too. An amorous male strokes a female's back with his flipper. These courtship sessions go on for hours, even days. They're often accompanied by a weird series of sounds. In matters of love, whales might truly be called warm-blooded. Their body temperature is about the same as ours. They become sexually mature at about the same age, and like us, they may live for roughly the biblical three score years and ten. calf cruises alongside its mother as if she were a tanker from which it is refueling. At Valdis, one of the most endearing things the Paines observed was the bond between mothers and calves. This calf is probably just under a year old. Like most youngsters, he wants his mother to nurse him. He rears out of the water and thumps his ten-ton weight down on his mother's back.
His mother puts up with it for a while and then dives, giving him a cautionary slap with her tail flukes in the process. He takes the hint and next time breaches on his own. Finally, he swims up alongside to nuzzle her. For the first time, thanks to Des Bartlett's camera, Roger Payne has been able to get intimate close-up underwater studies of his beloved right whales. Like something out of a Jules Verne fantasy, a 50-footer passes within feet of the camera. The sea off Valdis is like soup, making underwater photography exceedingly difficult. It's clouded with a minute plankton on which these huge creatures live. They strain the tiny animal and vegetable organisms from the water by means of baleen or whalebone filters in their mouths. Bartlett's camera hovers feet above the blowhole of a female whale well known to the pains. A jaw partly opens, but not to swallow the cameraman like Jonah. The camera boat has awakened it, and the whale is simply yawning. Its intentions appear entirely peaceful. runs the very real risk of being knocked unconscious or having his skull fractured by a blow from the tail flukes as the great body brushes by him. Almost totally hidden beneath a beetling eyebrow of white, a close-up of that small eye. Here's one of the rarest shots of a whale ever taken. You're looking right down its throat as it feeds with its mouth wide open. A mouth so huge a man could stand upright inside it. The little red eye watches the camera without alarm. In his wetsuit, the cameraman probably looks very much like a seal. The whale passes mysteriously into the murk. The tail, which can drive it at all of 12 miles per hour underwater, gently propelling it along. They arrive at Valdis in May. They leave in December. Their subsequent journeys are only partly known. But Roger Payne does know that they go north to the coast of Brazil and also southeast into the empty mid-Atlantic waters near South Georgia one of the main whale areas in the South Atlantic. As the whales leave Valdis, they face a voyage of thousands of miles. Roger is left behind to wonder at their fate. People sometimes ask, of what use are whales to man? To Roger Payne, the question is presumptuous. It assumes that whales should exist solely for our use. A more suitable question might be, what use is man to whales? Payne feels we must learn something from the last dying agonies of the whaling industry. We must learn that it is as wrong to assume the earth revolves around man as it was to assume the sun revolved around the earth. In the Antarctic, the once vast herds of whales are gone. They died because we saw them only as an industrial resource and failed to realize their other qualities. 
qualities which they, as the real masters of the oceans, might someday teach us. Most countries have accepted the recommendations of the International Whaling Commission and ceased hunting for the time being. But there are still two countries, Japan and Norway, that continue to slaughter them, 300 this year, for so-called scientific purposes. While the right whales and many other species are now reasonably well protected, their long-term survival is by no means guaranteed. The temptations of financial rewards are not dead, only dormant. That massive symbol of greed, the whaling industry, is not only shooting whales out of business, but itself as well. Look at this thriving whaling station in the Antarctic before the First World War. Look at it now. All that leaping, spouting, singing host of whales traded for a pile of scrap metal. What an ignominious end for such a fantastic creature, and what a waste. To Roger Payne, there is no question. The sea must be made safe for whales, so that once again the triumphant words of the creation can echo their joyful message across the oceans of the earth. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the sea. Shadow of the Whale continues next Sunday at 8 with a fascinating look at the aftermath of Krakatoa, including the first ever film of the rare Javan rhino.